Welcome. Let me talk about some Fibonacci surprises in this PowerPoint presentation. So first of all, what are the Fibonacci numbers? Well, they're the numbers 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8. Each number is the sum of the two before. 1 plus 1 is 2, 1 plus 2 is 3, 2 plus 3 is 5, and so on. Uh, these numbers appear in a myriad of places in mathematics and even in nature. And if you were to go on the internet and search Fibonacci numbers, you'll find all sorts of surprises there. Lots and lots of stuff to keep you busy for weeks, months, years even. But I want to talk about one particular appearance of the Fibonacci numbers. And that's from a classic path counting puzzle. So what I want to do is talk about a honeycomb. Here's a two-road honeycomb and ask how many ways can I walk from start at the left to E and at the right. Now each path must go from one cell to a neighboring cell and each, each motion must have some rightward component to it. So I can take horizontal steps on the upper level to the right. Maybe I can take horizontal steps to the right on the lower level. I can take diagonal steps, maybe di diagonal down and to the right or diagonal up towards the right. But I can never go to the, any, anything that's leftward. So many paths are there from start to end in this picture. And you can start drawing paths, you can start you know, having lots of fun getting out your colored pencils, and you'll soon find that the number of paths seems to be overwhelming. Well, a classic thing in mathematics is actually if you want to look at a complex problem, start with smaller problems first. So let's do that here. So here's the start. Let's ask how many ways can I get to just the cell directly below the start? Well, if you think about it, there's only one way you can do it. You can't go over and back down because it has a leftward component to it. So there's only one path that gets to the cell directly below start. All right, have it the cell to the right of the start. Well, a little bit of thought shows there's only two paths there. Now things get interesting. Let's go to the next cell on the bottom row. How many ways can I get to that cell? Well, you can actually draw it out, and you can see there's actually three ways to get there. And things start to get tedious. So let's ask, how many ways can I get to the next cell on the top row? And start being a little more intelligent about it. Well, I can either get to the cell on the top row, I can either get to the three, use the three paths already got at the cell below it and take a step up, or I can get myself to the cell directly to its left and take any of those two paths and step to the right. So it gives a total of five ways to get to this particular cell. In fact, that construct shows the secret. To get to any one particular cell, either get to the cell immediately to its left and take a step over, or get to its cell directly above it, or below it, below it depending on which, which row you're on, and take any one of those paths and step down towards it. So each cell, the number of paths to it, is the number of cells in the previous cells to its left, and the number of, cells, um, the number of paths to its cell above it or below it. Actually, that means you've got the sum of the two previous terms in the sequence going on, which is precisely the construct of the Fibonacci numbers. So what we have really here is the Fibonacci numbers appear in this puzzle. Each term is the sum of the two numbers before it, and that matches the Fibonacci numbers. So that means in my original puzzle, this, this box shows the original design, was this the start, this is the end. There are F12, the 12th Fibonacci number ways to get from start to end in the original puzzle, and that's 144. By the way, it's very convenient to call this first Fibonacci number 1 that was on the list in, in red at the beginning. So let's say this, you know, don't know what it means, but there's one way to get from start to start. And then I guess do nothing, you're already there. All right. So that's very classic. Let's have fun interpreting these paths in, in interesting ways. We've got a very visual model now of the Fibonacci numbers. So let's have fun. And I'll do some classic appearances first. Um, I'm going to get tired of drawing honeycombs. So what I'm going to do is just draw the center of the honeycombs. They're going to be dots. And I'll draw a zigzag path of segments between those dots. So here's a, a honeycomb with a 11 segments in it for 12 dots, six on the top row, six on the bottom row. So I know there's actually 144 ways to get from the start to end in this particular picture. All right. What I'm going to do is notice that each diagonal step actually follows one of these segments of the diagonal segment. But each horizontal step skips over two diagonal segments. So really what I've done here is I've broken those 11 zigzag segments into steps of either one by diagonals or two by the horizontals. And that gives me a partition of those 11 segments as a sum of, as a sum of ones and twos. And it's not hard to see that backwards also works. If I give you a sum of 1s and 2s to add up to 11 first, that does indeed correspond to a path. Each 1 is a diagonal step, each 2 is a horizontal step, depending on which row you're on. So actually, path counting and writing a number as a sum of 1s and 2s are exactly the same problem. So the number of partitions of a number n into 1s and 2s, we've just shown now, is the same as the number of paths, which must be a Fibonacci number. That's a very classic result, and let's move on. This time, let's not focus on the segments of the zigzag path, let's focus on the dots of the zigzag path. And let's think of each up and down step as a break between dots. So here again is my 11 zig zig zigzag segments, I've now got my 12 dots. So each up and down step, I'm going to think, is really breaking those, uh, those 12 dots apart. So that gives me a partition of the number 12. In this case, we've got 1 dot, 1 dot, 3 dots, 1 dot, 5 dots, 1, and they add up to 12. There's the 12 dots partitioned. But what's interesting to note here is that between any two breaks, I'm on one row and I end on the same row, there must be an odd number of dots between any set of breaks. Which is curious, that means I've got a partition of number 12 purely in terms of odd numbers. 
And it's not hard to see that this correspondence works both ways. If I give you a partition of number 12 into odd numbers, it does correspond to a path. So we have a result now. Each partition of a number n into odd parts corresponds to a path, and there must be a Fibonacci number of those. So the number of odd partitions of a number n is a Fibonacci number. Again, a classic result, but it's very clear and obvious if you look at path walking. Let's go on. Let's go back to looking at zigzag segments, and let's focus on the segments again. But now I'm going to add a segment at the beginning and a segment at the end. So here's my 12 dots again, but now I've got 13 zigzag segments. All right, let's have fun. For any path, here's a path, let's circle the dots it misses and interpret those in a curious way. Well, this divides the zigzag line into segments. For example, there's three segments before the first circle dot, there's three to the next circle dot, two to the next circle dot, three to the next circle dot, and then two after that. What's curious, I'll never circle two consecutive segments, because any path has to go through a pair of dots, at least one of the pair of dots. So there'll never be just a single segment between circle dots, which means what I've got here is a partition of those 13 zigzag segments into numbers, none of which would ever be a one. So now we've got another classic result. Every path corresponds to partition of a number n into numbers bigger than one, and the correspondence works both ways. You can check that if I give you such a, a partition of number n into segments without a one, one free partitions, I'm going to have a path and hence have a Fibonacci number of them. So the number of Fibonacci, uh, number of uh, one free partitions of a number n is going, going to be a Fibonacci number. All right, I've gone through that fairly quickly because these are actually classic results. These are well known. I think it's now time to get wild and to show how wild I'm going to get if it was spinning shape here. All right, let's get let's have some fun. Non-nested parentheses. I'm going to ask, how many ways can I place non-nested parentheses around n objects? What do I mean by that? Well, here's one object, one x. Either I don't place parentheses around it, or I do place parentheses around it. This is pretty simple, not much to do here. There's two options available to me. Here's two objects. I want to place parentheses around these objects so, then, so that I never have nested parentheses. Well, I have to leave the objects alone, put parentheses around the first, or put parentheses around the second, put parentheses around both, or parentheses around both in this sense, each individually. But I don't want to do parentheses and then bigger parentheses around that, no nesting. Now I see there's five ways to do that. All right, if I look at three objects and you've got the patients, I can list 13 ways, it turns out, to put non-nested parentheses around 13 objects. But look at these numbers, 2, 5, 13. They're Fibonacci numbers. In fact, it looks like every second Fibonacci. We missed 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13. So the question is, in this non-nested parentheses puzzle, are we indeed really getting every second Fibonacci number? Well, the answer is yes. Here's why. Let's consider powers that start on a top dot and end on a top dot. And let's focus on what happens on the bottom row of dots. We can think of each down and up step as actually parentheses placed around the dots on the bottom row. In fact, you can see now, here's one particular path. A path gives you a way to put non-nested parentheses around the lower dots. And it's not hard to see, I'll let you think about this, that if I put non-nesting parentheses around lower dots first, it corresponds to a unique path. So now I've got a perfect matching between non-nested parentheses and paths. The reason I'm getting every second Fibonacci number is I'm focusing on paths that start on the top and end on the top. So I'm getting the, the Fibonacci numbers that correspond to paths on the top row. That's every second Fibonacci number. F1, F3, F5, F7, F9, F11, F13. Well, there it is. So Fibonacci numbers appear in this non-nested parentheses game. Let's keep going. Double one partitions. How many ordered partitions of n are there with two different types of one? What do I mean by that? Suppose I want to break a number n into a sum of numbers, um, maybe the whole number itself or smaller numbers. But this time I'm going to give myself two different types of way of writing number one. So if we, maybe I'll have a black one and a red one. In which case, there's two ways to write the number one itself. I'll either leave it as a black one or leave it as a red one. For the number two, I could write number two as it is, or I could write it as one plus one, but given that there's two different types of one, and it now gives me a total of five possible options for partitioning number two, the two different types of one. If I look at number three and play the same game with two different types of one, there's actually 13 ways to partition the number three. Two, five, 13. Every second Fibonacci number again. Is that indeed the case? Why, yes. And in fact, path walking will make it clear. Again, let's look at paths that start on the top dot and end on a top dot. 
In fact, we can code any such path as either one step over along the top row in a lower fashion, or maybe one step over in the top row in an upper fashion, horizontal step up here, or I can do some of these longer underground paths that go, so sort of, in this case, three steps over along the top row, and I'll just call that an ordinary three. So actually, each path clearly corresponds to a partition of the uh, dots on the top row uh, with two different types of one, a lower one and an upper one. So I've got the result. The number of ordered partitions of a number n with two different types of one is indeed going to be a Fibonacci number. In fact, every second Fibonacci number again, the ones correspond to this, that ending on the top row. This is just wild and crazy. I'll carry on in part two of this little video.